This is Pat Soundbites Unplugged. Unplugged. The podcast where all the artists go to tell it as it is. Careers, music, tours, and more. And here's your host, the man that refuses to eat squid, Pat Calamari. Hey, Pat Calamari here, host of Pat Soundbites Unplugged. Hope everyone is well and following the rules. Hopefully we'll be outside before you know it, rocking and rolling. Today, episode number 68, it's a good one. Christopher Griffiths out of Nashville. Christopher releasing his debut EP, Midlife Pop Crisis. Officially out on June 2nd. Boy, does that say a lot. Midlife Pop Crisis. And that's really what it is. Pop Crisis. If you like pop and you like dance, well, it brought me back to putting on my boogie shoes, a little KC and a Sunshine Band, a little Earth, Wind, and Fire, Let's Groove, a little Madonna, great kind of dance tracks by Christopher, who's uh, an accomplished singer, songwriter, producer, multi-instrumentalist, very talented musician out of Nashville. He's the bassist in Will Hogue's band. Uh, obviously no tour, so Will is uh, not doing any shows, so... Christopher taking advantage of the coronavirus lockdown and uh, penned out 42 tracks, and he felt that these four match the best. So he put them out. Why not? And let me tell you, it's pretty good stuff. If you want to get your dancing boogie boogie shoes on and crank it up, well, buy Christopher's EP. It'll definitely get you dancing tracks like Dream and My Adidas. I have played Incredible Lie. Painted Smile and Without the Beat. And it says it all right there. For the amount of a cup of coffee, you can buy this EP. So, why don't you? Christopher's got a great sense of humor, very talented guy. And actually, I'm looking forward to the other, what, 38 tracks of uh, different genres that he's put together. So, it'll be fun. Christopher is also a Juno award winner which is uh the canadian grammys uh per se for songwriting so uh he's been around he's got his act together and i'm here to support him keep a new music alive on the radio airways so live love and laugh a lot because life is way too short sit back and enjoy our chat today Hi, my name is Christopher Griffiths, and you're listening to Pat Soundbites Unplugged. WBXO Classic Rock, redefined in conjunction with Pat Soundbites Unplugged. Pretty cool having an established musician, songwriter, producer, Mr. Christopher Griffiths out of Nashville. What's going on, Christopher? Oh, just having a rainy uh, southern day right here. Damn, when you gave me my credits, I thought you were talking about someone else. <laughs> No, your wife does a really good job in writing it all up for folks like myself, but I know uh, this certainly ain't your first rodeo. You've been doing this for quite a while. Christopher will be releasing his debut EP, Midlife Pop Crisis. Well, if that don't say it all, it actually comes out on June 2nd, 2020, four tracks. And uh, as I said to Marianne, and I said to you a few minutes ago, it... uh, I mean, I'm looking for my shoes, and I'm looking for my, uh, you know, John Travolta moves that I never really had, and uh, going, where's little KC, a little Earth, Wind, and Fire, let's get grooving, a little Madonna, and I said, man, he's uh, taking care of business uh, while being in lockdown mode, so uh, let's start with that, Christopher, um, we're in uh, this lockdown, and you're an artist, and you're a songwriter, and there's no shows, and you're going, man, I got, there's got to be something I could do here, and uh, you knocked off these four songs, and I'm uh, going to release this. Is that pretty much the uh, how it all transpired and how it started? Oh, yeah. I'm basically just the Andy Gibbs story. I put on my, my, my boogie shoes and, uh, and got to work. Um we were in this lockdown and I was actually on stage when they announced that they weren't going to have live music anymore and then my tour was canceled so I'm playing this gig and my phone's going off behind me and I kind of peek over and it's like no gigs tomorrow no gigs next month so when I got home I was kind of worrying about it and uh, I just said man I don't have 20 instruments in my house I got a laptop I'm just going to start making songs and I made like 42 songs And people would send me a little Venmo, a little money, and I'd send it to them. But these four just went together really well. 
And so I decided to make a little EP. And uh, I just wanted to give my wife something to dance to in the kitchen while she's writing her cookbooks. <laughs> and she's got a glass of wine in her hand. I know that. Well, that's cool. <laughs> When I made this record, it was a bottle of wine. Well, yeah, four songs all written, performed, and recorded, uh, and he got so forty-two. So I guess there's a chapter two to this. Now, are you going to stay with the uh, dancing groove? Or are we going to go a little Willie Hodge Americana? Are we going to do a little country? We're going to do a little rock and roll. What's the uh, what's the plan down the road to get these others out? Oh man, I'm thinking polka, right? Bring polka back. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody gets some beer. Leader I look great in Leader I don't know how you do. I got Leader for radio. Oh my goodness! Roll out the barrel, buddy. Right? Sorry, I got another EP probably this fall that'll come out, and that one's going to be more acoustic. It'll be more John Hyatt, more maybe Tom Waits. I don't know, something along those lines. I like the fact that you call your sound garage rock for disco lovers. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Nobody's got that genre, I can tell you that. That's cool. Oh yeah, garage disco is all mine. What? I it up. What got you into the what got you into music, Christopher? Can you tell me about the moment you realized you said, Hey, I wanna be that musician, I wanna be that guy on stage. Anybody in your family musically inclined or who got you your first guitar? How did it all start with you? Oh, I have an uncle that plays blues guitar and he's really really good he sounds a little like robert cray he's oh. very very good but most of my family just plays the radio you know which is important too it's also important but uh we had like a piano tuner come to the house once to tune this piano no one played named ed hannenberg he's a good dude and when he would play piano i would just sit there and kind of follow him on the keys and that turned into lessons but i wasn't super good at the piano and then uh one christmas my mom got me a guitar and i just uh Started playing it like six hours a day. Um, started a bunch of bands. I won a Northern Michigan Rocks contest. That was kind of hilarious. I used to wear silk dragon shirts, right? Like, <laughs> I'd walk out in a kimono and play uh, Gibson SG, punk rock and whatnot. And then uh, I just kept doing it. It seemed like what I was really good at. So I just kept doing it. And it eventually led me to Nashville. Now, I read you, you did go to college. You went to Berkeley, right, in uh, Boston? I did. Yeah, I went for two, maybe three years. But I got offered a gig, and I figured I could talk about doing it or I could go do it, so I just uh, I took the gig. Well, yeah, I mean, they, right, education is great, but, I mean, there's no better knowledge and experience. Um, I mean, you could always go back or go online, but... To learn of what you've been, you know, on stage and the experience, you can never, you can, they can never teach you that. I mean, they can talk about it, but they can never teach you that, which is really cool. Um, well, Berkeley's Berkeley's pretty amazing about giving people a full dose of music and music culture and the networking of it. I mean, I, I got that gig because I was at Berkeley. It was a friend of mine named Natalie Stovall. She needed a bass player, and she's she's done pretty well for herself too. But um, you know, so I drove down, and I intended on coming back, but uh, I don't know if you've ever had Nashville hot chicken, but I just decided to stick around and keep eating it. <laughs> I got down to Nashville. I haven't been back, and I need to get back. Real, It's on my definitely bucket list to get back. Um, I went down to Nashville in 1984, 85, because I was a Nashville. I was a yeah, I was a big fan of Alabama. And um, Alabama, the the country, the great country band, always did a June jam in Fort Payne in their hometown. So I flew in to Nashville, and then I rented a car and uh, drove out to Chattanooga, and then right over the line it was Fort Payne. And uh, but you're right. I mean, I that was a you know Hank Williams Senior and you know all the oldies. I mean, it was all country. And today. I mean, even when I talk to Mark Slaughter of Slaughter, I talk to Tom Peterson of Cheap Trick, I talk to anybody and everybody, I go, where are you in L.A.? And they go, oh, no, we're in Nashville. And Nashville seems to become the real portal of, you know, Music City USA. Now, forget the country thing anymore. I mean, it seems that way, but I, I need to get down there and uh, really take that in and see what's what's cooking. Is that... 
I mean, there's so much songwriting down there, and it, it, it's incredible. I mean, what? Explain what Nashville is to you right now, uh, Christopher, and the, and the changes that you've seen. Well, Nashville right now to me is, is my house, but uh, <laughs> yeah, Tom Peterson, man, I just did a show with his daughter last year, Oh, uh, and he played bass, and I'm a big fan, so I was bugging him, right, like you do when you're a big fan, you just bug him. Like, I think a lot of people try to be cool when they're in the same industry, but I just go fan, I just go, hey, Tom, I really love you, and um, I was playing a green Thunderbird bass, and Tom walked out, and he was playing a green Thunderbird bass unplanned and we kind of sat there and looked at each other for a while and I was wearing a scarf and he was wearing a scarf and I was wearing a top hat <laughs> and I looked at him and I said so um I'm gonna go change he goes hey thanks man thank you very much so I went and got put on some different clothes and picked a different base but he was a real charmer that was a really great guy and, and uh, I really enjoyed talking to him I ran into Mark a couple times too you, you know um, it, it, Tom I I found that uh, Leela put out a song in reference to her brother who's got autism and uh, Tom was kind of promoting it and I got wind of it and I contacted him and said, dude, I'm, I'm going to play it. I want to interview her. I want to play it on my radio show, Keeping Your Music Alive and, and help her out. And he loved it. She loved it. And I promoted uh, their rock, uh, oh, I can't even think of what it's called, Rock for Autism that him and his wife uh, do and uh, in fact, Tom, you know, I'm telling Tom where I'm from in the Hudson Valley here in New York, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I lived there. I lived there for like 15 years, and I got to meet him a couple of times before a cheap trick show." But uh, yeah, it's funny. You do have that. You know, you got the scarf, you got the hat. You know, and that's definitely Tom on stage today with cheap tricks. And that's that's pretty. Yeah, that's pretty funny. And I would say to Mark Slaughter, I mean, can you go to Walmart? And he's like, "Oh yeah." I put my hair in a ponytail, wear a baseball cap. Nobody's looking for rock stars. They're looking for Keith Urban and Tim McGraw, so it fits well for us here. <laughs> yeah, John Karabi lives down here, and I, someone explained to me the other day that I've actually met him like nine times. I just don't recognize his face because I just haven't seen him in that long. And, and But uh, apparently I've met him a bunch. He's a good singer. Oh, my God. Ex um, excellent singer, yes. Yeah, Benny Vincent lives somewhere around me. We're supposedly neighbors. I just haven't ran into him. If you could uh, call anybody to collaborate a song with you, uh, Christopher, anybody stick out in mind that you go, oh, yeah, I, I would love to do that? Oh, yeah, I think it's got, I mean, every day that list would change, right, depending on what was on my radio that, sport, that morning. But right now, Butch Walker, I don't know if you listen to Butch Walker, but I, he, um, He's way on my list. Like he's he's my hot ten of ten. Really? I know the name, but I'm not familiar with the music. Is more of a blues guy. Butch, um, Butch is a little all over the place, but he had a band in the '80s called South Gang, and they were kind of a hair metal band. And then he had a band in the '90s called Marvelous Three, and I'm almost half tempted to sing it a song right now. And then uh. He's a producer. He produced for Taylor Swift, Keith Urban, Weezer. Wow. Um, all those type of bands. Seven Dust. Uh, Jennifer Nettles. He did that Jennifer Nettles single, I Don't Want to Be That Girl, with your guy, which is a great idea for a song. He did Kevin the Craw. But, um, and then he, he makes his own music, too. He's just fantastic. He's like a L.A. dude from Atlanta. So he's Southern West Coast. Nice. And, Dude, you got to check him out. I'll make you a mixtape. I will definitely uh, check him out. I see, well, you mentioned uh, Michigan. Is that where you got a lot of your influence, that Motown, a little a little bit of Motown, a little bit of Madonna, a little bit where you, you draw this with the uh, with your four tracks without the beat, Painted Smile, Incredible Lie, and I love Dream and My Adidas. That's, that's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. That, that song's about... My wife and I were in Miami, and I was wearing, like, an all-white suit. Like, just with Miami, what you think they'd wear, like Don Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but my shoes were uncomfortable, so I put on my Adidas. And we went to some dance club, and we were dancing all night long. Um, and I just think about that moment, because we'd already been married for eight years, but you, you get that first energy date, like that first date energy. So that's kind of what we were doing, and... 
I don't know. I thought maybe Adidas would send me a couple of shoes. You never know. I can always use more shoes. <laughs> I hear you, man. Professionally, I see that you won a Juno, and that's that's like the comparison of a Grammy in Canada. Am I correct with that? Yeah, I think so. Um, it was kind of explained to me after the fact, but yeah, I uh, I sort of I was playing bass for a lady named Crystal Shawanda, and uh, I wrote a song on her record, and then the record won Best Aboriginal um, Album. And they wanted Juno. So, by proxy, I wanted Juno. Nice. Which is cool. I played bass on that record. And it's a good record. It's a, it was fun. That was a fun gig. How did, how did you... What was the timing? How did you get hooked up with Willie Hodge? Or, I mean, where, I know you, we talked about <laughs> why you left the school and you, you played bass with a, uh, uh, an artist. But where was the real big timing of getting hooked up with like somebody like... Willie, that you know, now you're part of the band and you're on tour. Oh yeah, Will Ho. Will, Will Ho. I had been um, um, I've been kind of just just dallying around in like party bands, going to play spring break parties and biker rallies. And I was playing with uh, Keith Anderson, who's a country artist in Nashville. He had a couple big songs, but uh, I don't know. I was just kind of getting sick of my my scene, and um. Man, I, I got a call from a drummer I played with, and he said, Hey, man, do you like Will Hogue? I said, Yeah, I'm a big fan. Why, you want to go see him? He's like, No, do you want to play for him? I said, Well, like a showcase? Because Will's also a producer. He goes, No, do you want to play bass for Will Hogue? I said, Yes, I would like that very much. And so I was in Panama City on Sunday night playing a show. And he's like, Okay, be in Nashville Monday at noon. And these are your five songs. So I played till 2.30 in the morning in Panama City, packed all my gear, left at 3, got into Nashville at 10 a.m., learned the songs uh, between 10 and 11, and walked on to my audition at noon. And uh, it was just in, like, my buddy's basement. It was just like a garage band situation. And we just started jamming. I was singing backups. And we had a great time. I got a call that night, and Will just said, hey, come play with me. And I said, Cool. You got any gigs? And he goes, yeah, we have a wedding in Denver. Oh. I said, oh, yeah, a wedding. Very cool. <laughs> and I started thinking, maybe this gig's not as cool as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and then he said, yeah, we got, a, we got a wedding in Denver, and then we got to play four days in Italy and one in Spain. I said, cool. And I turned to my wife, and I said, hey, Marianne, I got the gig. And she goes, I'm so happy for you. I love you. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I got to go to Italy for four days, and I got to go to Spain. She goes, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to bring home some wine. Send home some wine. Yeah, oh my goodness. I, I did, man. When I was walking through customs, my whole bag was clanging. That's the way like 120 pounds. I also noted here, you're a producer. What makes a what makes a good producer, Christopher? How hard is it to shut down your thinking process as a musician? And become a really good listener for the client that you're working on. Is that is that a it's got is that got to be a hard thing to do? So you're not over influencing, you know, or, or making so many changes to their, um, you know, their thoughts behind your tunes. How does that work for you? I have no idea, man. <laughs> you figure it out. You can tell me. Uh, yeah, I just uh, oh, I started boy. talking, and they started calling me a producer, so I kept talking. Um, which I'm apt to do. No, I, uh, so I guess I produced these Anthony Oreo records a while back because I had done all the arrangements for them. But my first foray really into holding all the reins in one hand was um, this Carolyn Fister artist who's amazing. She's really, really good. But she just, uh, I don't know, she was in like a Nashville lull. She just uh, couldn't uh, take that next step. So... I just told her one night, I'm like, I believe in you, and if someone isn't going to jump on this and get your music out there, I'll do it. And what it, became, what it came down to was someone to just say, believe in yourself, you know, trust right. your instincts. Right. Get in there, sing with everything you have, don't worry about what people are going to think, don't worry about The Voice or National Star or American Idol, just worry about these next three and a half minutes and make it you. And really... Um, kind of carve back the things that everybody has 
and focus on the things that just you have. And so as far as I know, as a producer, that's what I'm supposed to do. Wow. Well, that's powerful stuff because you really said it well and saying, look, just be confident. It's your stuff. Believe in it and, and make it work and bring out yeah. the magic in it. So you really didn't influence at all of anything of your background. You just said, hey, that's your song. Go for it. Let it go. Is that a big, that's got to be, a, I mean, a major challenge. A buddy of mine goes down to Nashville a lot and says, you know, every night you can go to any open bar, well, not an open bar, you go to any bar and there's an open mic night and, you know, now you almost have to, like, really be somebody to try to get into some of these places to be, to get that exposure, to be able to play, you know, maybe a half hour or an hour. I'm sure that's got to be like a... Everybody wants to be able to do that, but it's got to be a major challenge besides trying to get on the radio and, you know, but you never know who could be in the audience, you know? Right. Well, I mean, I think it comes down to tenacity, really, because um, I have friends who come into town and they kind of just look around and say, nope, I like being the big fish in my small pond, and they go back to Michigan. But I have friends who come down with even less notoriety and just start pounding the ground, you know, making friends, finding places to play, find a place to sit in. Uh, when I moved to Nashville, I used to just wait till the club was dead. And then I would just go up with 20 bucks and say, hey, can I play bass on one, maybe sing a song? And they go, yeah. And I'd hand it to them. i go up and do my thing. Pretty soon I wasn't paying. Pretty soon I wasn't called to come do it. So does it help to have some notoriety? Yes, it totally helps. Um, but do you have to? No, nah, you just have to be willing to throw all your weight behind this one goal, you know, which is scary. It's really scary. But it's what you got to do to make things happen. Well, definitely self-motivation and definitely hard work. I mean, you said earlier when we started to chat, I mean, you played guitar, you wouldn't put the thing down, and then you pursued and went to college a little bit too. So it's not, just doesn't happen overnight. Um, but um, the, uh, the EP, uh, Christopher, out on all the digital platforms... Yeah, I haven't seen it on Spotify yet, but I think it's still kind of processing. Okay. But it's on Apple Music and iTunes and Google, probably on Amazon, I haven't checked. Um, and there's like a pre-sale, it's only like three bucks, so you're really not risking it. I'm not selling the box set, you know, it's not the 1999 box set. It's just a, it's a little collection of songs. You spend three bucks, you know, you could get one comic book or you can get my EP. You can get half a Starbucks cup of coffee or you can get my EP. <laughs> and... Uh, a good way of marketing it and you got your website christophergriffithsmusic.com you're on instagram you're on facebook you're on twitter you're on youtube and i see you are taking advantage of while you're home you're doing the online streaming i missed it a little bit yesterday because i was in and out we had a beautiful day here and trying to take care of some yard work and watch what's going on but uh i see you're doing that so congratulations on that any other projects that i can help promote oh sure um, June 2nd, Tara Lynn Fister's next single comes out. That song called Scars. I wrote that with her. That's a really good song. It's a rocker. It sounds like ACDC. It's funny because the verses sound like talking heads, but the choruses are all ACDC. Um, and that's June 2nd. And then June 26th, the new Will Hogue record comes out, Tiny Little Movies. And I played and worked on that. And that's going to be, uh, you're going to love it. It's like the White Album, but it's not white. And there's not as many songs. Well, I'm looking forward to it, man. I appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. I will be throwing in your tracks on my show on Sundays, keeping new music alive on the radio is what I do. And uh, it, it puts a smile on my face and brings back a lot of great memories. And the one thing we know that the listeners will definitely be bebopping and jumping around, and we'll, uh, we'll let it go from there, my man. Yeah, man, squeeze in between Billy Thorpe and Manfred Mann. I think that's where I'll go really well. <laughs> but I think I played um, Incredible Lie right after Genesis. Maybe uh, Perfect. I, I played, um, uh, oh my goodness, I, Invisible Touch, or one of them I played in, and I said, this is a perfect fit for Christopher. Let me throw that right in there, and it, uh, it went very well. All right, my man, thank you so much, Christopher. No problem, man. Anytime. Christopher Griffiths, it's called Midlife Pop Crisis. Go check it out. 
buy a cup of uh, coffee and buy Chris's four tracks of on the EP. Yeah, yeah. get it now. Get it while well fine.